We're not just stories about being victims. What we need to do is acknowledge those deaths. Humor, prankster, troll sensibility. Welcome to Your World by Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Karumi in San Francisco. COVID-19 has small businesses fighting for survival like never before. First up, we're taking you to New York where a community is banding together to try and keep this one unique bar afloat. There's a purpose for this place to stay open. And to be honest, if we were to close, where are we going to go? Where would the black LGBT community that lives on 140, 125th, 125th, 148th, where are we going to go? It's the only home that we have. Hi everyone, I'm Alexi Minko, the owner of Alibi Lounge, the only black-owned LGBT establishment in New York. Having a black LGBT-owned establishment in Harlem fits perfectly the mold. It was important to show the fact that Harlem was actually a culture of embrace. It was Alibi destiny to be an inclusive face in Harlem. And when we faced, fortunately, challenges like last year when our flags got burned down twice during Pride, which was quite traumatizing, I have to say that the Harlem Knights have rallied around us nonstop. And with what's going on right now, in America, it's important to, to let the world know that we're not just stories about being victims and we're also stories about resilience, about success, about overcoming adversity and challenges. Small business owners are the real heroes of the American economy. Like everyone in the city, by March 16th, we were sent home. Financial, it, it was a disaster. In New York City, you usually have people coming from all over the world for the parade, and, and the streets were empty. There was barely any decorations, you have barely any music, and in terms of the business, there was barely any traffic. The message is clear. <laughs> Nobody wants us to go anywhere. It's the, probably the most humbling experience I've had so far in my life, because we had a very small amount at first, and within six days, you know, the goal was achieved. I didn't realize until then that over people thought the place was special. I knew it was special. I think uh, my team knew it was special. We, we loved it. But to see that over 100,000 people think the same thing, it validates you. Alibi is my child. It's an extension of who I am. It's the only place in Harlem where you have rainbow flags floating outside 24 seven for the past four years. That's what it means. You can burn them down, you, you can steal them. <laughs> we will always have rainbow flags floating at the door. We're staying in New York for our next story to introduce you to a little known burial site. With the confirmed global death count from COVID-19 having surpassed half a million people, Heart Island reminds us of the importance of acknowledging those deaths. I thought I was going to see a very dark place, but what I felt as soon as I got there, that, that it was actually a very spiritual place. Heart Island is in the Long 
Island Sound, so it's as far east as you can go and still be in New York City. All of the sort of major illnesses that have afflicted New York City, a 1918 flu epidemic, uh, lots of people died in New York City and were buried on Heart Island. The most recent epidemic was the AIDS epidemic. Heart Island is just the place where anyone whose family didn't choose a private burial or cremation is, is buried. A lot of people in New York City do agree to a city burial. Uh, the medical examiner reported last year that over 70% of the burials on Heart Island were with family consent. So it's not any one type of person. It's a very diverse cemetery. Everybody is buried in exactly the same way. And it's a highly organized uh, grid system. When you look at the video, it looks like such a gruesome, dark place. But when I look at that video, I see a very orderly burial process that shows that the city has capacity for thousands of burials this year, which is what they're going to need. What you want is for people to not fear uh, this, you know, pauper burial, potter's field, all that crazy stuff that is, it was magnified by the fact that the city used the penal system to bury the dead. That's, that's why that is so lingering. Parks now has jurisdiction. As of April 2nd, which was the last day of inmate labor on Heart Island, the majority of the of the casualties are going to wind up on Heart Island because there are an awful lot of people who live in public housing who can't social distance and, and are very, very vulnerable populations. So what we need to do is acknowledge those deaths and to make sure that Heart Island is a decent burial. This week, Mississippi became the last state in the U.S. to strip the Confederate emblem from its state flag. While some Southerners associate the flag with pride and Southern heritage, others now see it as a reminder of America's hateful history. There are symbols of it and reminders of it everywhere. So with it on my own body, it's just really embarrassing because I don't believe in the same things that the symbol represents and I don't want for other people to see it and assume that I do carry those same values. The Cover the Hate Project means people being able to put any form of inequality, any form of racism that they may have ever had in their heart, gone, away, erased. And when it's gone from them, it's gone from the world. You know, when I got this tattoo, like, 10 years ago, I had no idea what it actually stood for, so. They offered to cover up the hate tattoos for free. We entered the room like we normally do whenever we come into work, except it like, like I said, it was like in the air. If I can cover the tattoo with the leaves, yeah. the fire's gonna be banging. We just were like, we need to do something to be a part of this. We need to we need to cover up this racial stuff. This is this is our platform. This is our ability to be able to do that. This isn't a new idea. There's tattooers that have been offering this, I think, for a couple of years. 
But it wasn't until I seen a post from a tattooer that was like, you know, for my clients, if you have anything racist, let's get rid of it. And we were like, let's do that for the whole shop. Let's do it for hate in general. This town, it doesn't really have hate, but what little bits here, let's get rid of it. All right, are you ready? Yeah. I got the tattoo um, a couple weeks after I turned 18. I had a boyfriend that I was trying to impress, which um, you know, was not a good idea, especially if you don't know the meaning of it. What I've noticed with clients is the biggest thing is that the majority of them never even knew what it meant when they got it. So they're carrying a message and it's a message of hate that they've never even intended to have to begin with. If I went and got it, it would have impressed him and he would like it. And I thought it just really was more like a, you know, little country voice and symbol. Right. I never really thought about what it Try meant. Your head. First impressions sometimes kind of ruin a, 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 a whole light on how you have, on, how you identify with somebody, you know? And I'm sure that weighs a toll on somebody, on their mental health, well-being, and state of mind. 10 years now, I'm, I'm, you know, ashamed of the symbol that I put on my body. I think that that shows that there's a lot of people out there that are willing to change, that are ready to change, that have already changed, but stereotypically you look at what they have on them and you think that they haven't. Now, as I got older, I realized that it definitely has a meaning and a lot of people use it to spread hate. I think our country and now our nation's ability and wantonness to eradicate hate. I think we're fed up with it. When you're walking around with something that symbolizes hate or racism, nobody can feel. I think hate stems from ignorance. I think hate stems from maybe cowardice of not wanting it to grow or accept. The world is just, is, is hurting right now. Everybody in it needs love and compassion. And when you're walking around with something that symbolizes hate, you can't heal until all of the hate and all of the things that represent it are gone. Because all it does is bring a, a visual reminder. With the uh, Cover the Hate project, with the racial tattoos that we're covering up, it's um, it's so intense emotionally to hear someone pour their heart out about what a mistake they made five, 10, 20 years ago. And they've been living with it ever since. They're embarrassed by it. They haven't told anyone about it. But because of the movement, because of the bravery of all these hundreds of thousands of people across the world, they're ready to push themselves forward. What do you think? It's beautiful. I think she's happy. Good. I'm so happy that you can't see that here at all on either. Like, it's really cool. Um, we didn't want those fans anyways. Um, and if that hurts their feelings, we're simply into a new era now. We're into a new phase of where we don't care. We are we are standing up for what's right. And if you don't want to take the time to educate yourself and and see how people are offended, how they are are um, just kind of upset at things that NASCAR is doing, and NASCAR is listening for once and, and standing up for change in in those regards, then then we don't want you to be a part of our sport. President Trump's 4th of July celebrations at Mount Rushmore comes amid a national reckoning over racism. Native Americans say the mountain is as reprehensible as the statues of slave owners being toppled across the world. The Black Hills is ours. That's where our stories began. That is our Jerusalem. My name is Simon Moya Smith. I am a citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation, and I'm also Chicano. I'd ask whether or not you think I will someday be on Mount Rushmore, but... Mount Rushmore, I would believe for the United States is a celebration of their presidents. I don't see it that way. 
it's a desecration of our sacred site. That's where our creation story began. And it is, uh, unfortunately, uh, a tourist trap. But when you go there, people don't know the real history of it. And now they have four white guys right carved right into the, the mountain. One of them being uh, Abraham Lincoln, who still holds the record for, you know, hanging the most indigenous people in a single day. And as calls for removal grow louder, our next guest vows to protect one of the most iconic monuments in the world. Uh, the more we focus on the flaws of these men that are on our mountain, uh, the less likely we are to recognize the virtues. It's not as easy to, to tear down, of course, Mount Rushmore as it is, it is to tear down a statue to Robert Lee or Christopher Columbus, but I hope people begin to understand that these were racist white men. And you're going to have your first big fireworks display at Mount Rushmore. What can burn? It's stone. You know, it's stone. It's great. It's still our land. He's the latest white man to come into our territory. Natives are, are purposefully canceled out of the conversation because you can't be the greatest nation in the world if you're guilty of a genocide, right? What soapbox can you stand on? We're the smallest racial minority in our ancestral land. Think of that. Police brutality affects indigenous people because we're, we're such a small population, but we're up there with, with the black community. These are the numbers and these are the facts that I hope people will, will look into, not just about the desecration of our sites, but the fact that we want our land back and you know police brutality in Indian country. Indigenous women are 2.5 times more likely to be sexually assaulted than women of any other demographic. Right, so these are things that we hope people will will learn and research and share with others. We don't want it to be just like a short conversation about what is Mount Rushmore, what does the Black Hills mean to indigenous people, and then they move on. If you're a K-pop fan, you already know that fandom projects can be applied to political activism. And if you didn't, take a look. I feel like it's time. It's time for us to all come together. The majority of K-pop fans are people of color. They tend to be quite open-minded and pretty progressive in their uh, politics. And K-pop fan social media networks were used to spread the message pretty quickly. This is like a big prank. But then there's also a statement that this rally does not uh, represent them, that it stands for a set of values that go against what they care about. And this is their way of making that known. In both instances of spamming hashtags or signing up for these tickets and then not showing up, the coming together of a kind of humor, prankster, troll sensibility, and a pretty serious political stance. The systematic of racism seemed like nothing has changed, but what's different 2020 is that it seemed like the whole world is coming together, right? As an artist who do black music, who's inspired and, and who benefit from this culture, I thought that it was only right for me to talk about it. I don't want K-pop uh, to be marked as something else, something you know dangerous. And I wanted to let the world know that you know we express solidarity. And I was hoping that my other colleagues, uh, artist friends, joined the movement.
adversity really is a real core factor in making people very socially aware and having a lot of compassion and empathy for other people. Because we have to rely on each other for the information that goes across different cultures, I think that that naturally breeds a lot of empathy and compassion and awareness of what's happening outside of our own personal bubbles. It's nice to see people stop pigeonholing fans of Korean artists or even any pop artists as just that one thing and understand that these are people who are active in their communities and in politics and in charity and helping other people. At the same time within the fandom, there's still a lot of resistance to Black fans wanting to discuss and wanting to hold the artists more accountable for instances of cultural appropriation or profiting off Black culture without correctly kind of crediting it. So that's one area that I think is pretty complex. That's our show for this week. Remember, you can get a daily recap of the day's top stories by subscribing to our newsletter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.